Okay, well, let's get started. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Kate McIntosh. I'm the Executive Director of the Promise Institute here at UCLA School of Law, and I'm delighted to welcome you. Today's event is co-sponsored by the American Society of International Law, the UCLA Department of Gender Studies, and the UCLA Center for the Study of Women, and we're very grateful for their support. And on behalf of the Promise Institute and my UCLA colleagues, I'd like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people here in the LA Basin. Before I introduce our speaker, um, a short word on the organization of the event. Um, Patricia Sellers, our speaker, will uh, speak for around 40 minutes and will then have a conversation for around 20 minutes. And please use the Q&A function to pose your questions. You can also put your questions in there during the talk and I will gather them at the end and moderate the conversation. So a very warm welcome to Patricia Sellers. Patricia Sellers is an international criminal lawyer. She's the special advisor for gender for the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court. She's a visiting fellow at Kellogg Kel College at the University of Oxford, where she teaches international criminal law and human rights law. She's a practicing professor at London School of Economics and a senior research fellow at the Human Rights Center of the University of California at Berkeley. She was the legal advisor for gender, as well as the acting head of the legal advisory session, section and a prosecutor at the Yugoslavia Tribunal from 1994, the very early days to 2007, and the legal advisor for gender at the Rwanda Tribunal, the ICTR as well, from 1995 to 1999. She developed the legal strategies and was a member of the trial teams of leading cases Akayesu, Furunja and Kunarats. These landmark decisions remain the preeminent legal standards for the interpretation of sexual violence as war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, torture and enslavement. Ms. Sellers has been a special legal, legal consultant to UN Women, to the Gender and Women's Rights Division of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights and to the Secretary General's Special Representative to Children in Armed Conflict. In 2012, she was a member of an expert panel to review the UN Office of Internal Oversight that has initial investigative jurisdiction over UN peacekeepers. She's testified as an expert witness before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in the cases of Jay versus Peru in 2013, of Favela Nova Brasilia versus Brazil in 2016 on international obligations to investigate sexual violence. She will testify in 2020 in Albacín versus Ecuador. She was also a sworn expert witness before the Spanish national courts on issues of genocide and before the Colombia courts in two recent criminal cases concerning sexual violence related to the armed conflict there. She's lectured, lectured extensively on humanitarian and international criminal law and is the author of numerous articles, including relevantly to our discussion today, wartime female slavery enslavement question mark in the Cornell University Journal of International Law, rape and sexual violence, in the critically received new commentary to the Geneva Conventions published by Oxford University Press, reconsidering gender jurisprudence in the Oxford Handbook of Gender and Armed Conflict published by Oxford University Press in 2017, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She's also featured in the Discovery Channel series, Why We Hate, produced by Steven Spielberg, and in the acclaimed documentary film, The Uncondemned. Ms. Sellers is the recipient of the prestigious Prominent Women in International Law Award by the American Society of International Law. She holds an honorary doctorate in law from the City University of New York, as well as an honorary fellow for lifetime achievement from the Law School of the University of Pennsylvania, which is her alma mater. She's also been awarded the National Bar Association's Ron Brown International Lawyer Prize and the Global Center for Justice's inaugural Janet Benson Global Justice Award. I might add from my own personal experience working in the orbit of Patricia Sellers in international criminal law in The Hague that she has without a doubt achieved the status of feminist icon. Patricia, welcome. Uh, so Patricia joins us today to talk about her latest work building on this fantastic body which I've outlined in the introduction and that is the climb of the slave trade which she claims is missing in action. Kate, thank you very much for that wonderful, extensive, this is your life type of uh, welcome. And I would really like to uh, extend my appreciation not only to UCLA Law School, but to the Promise Institute 
and to the American Society of International Law for having invited me in my own home, but to the world with this lecture. So uh, my lecture concerns the international crime of the slave trade, which I and my co-author, Professor Jocelyn Gagetin Kestenbaum, are advancing that this crime is missing in action because it's underutilized. And it seems as if it's been abandoned. We've taken it out of our legal arsenal. And this is a disservice to the international law community. But firstly, I would like to dedicate this speech to my brother, Thomas Edward Sellers Jr., who passed away in July due to COVID-19. He is my most recent ancestor. I also dedicate this lecture to all who descend from persons who have been enslaved and to those who even today are traversing through their middle passage going to slavery. Let me start. From ancient times through the dark ages, the medieval era, the Renaissance, the different caliphates of the Abbasid and Imayyad, through the colonization and the independence of the new world, slavery and the slave trade have existed. The East African slave trade and the transatlantic slave trade existed throughout the 17th to the 19th century, and it spared no one, neither females nor males, neither children nor adults. All were traded, all were enslaved. The transatlantic slave trade shipped Africans westward, mainly to the Atlantic Caribbean, to North and South America, while the East African slave trade transported Africans eastward to Arabia, to the Ottoman Empire, and to South Asia through Zanzibar. Low estimates of Africans transported in the transatlantic slave trade stand at about 12 million human beings. Although the numbers of enslaved Africans in the East African slave trade remain in dispute, the estimates range from eight to 17 million. So we're talking about an international crime that has encompassed almost 30 million people over a period of 400 years. The slave trade, and I wanna to concentrate today on the slave trade and not as much on slavery, took multiple guises. Wars reduced captured enemy soldiers and civilians to slavery. There were often corporate interests that propelled the slave trade. And these corporate interests or financial interests were often backed or given monopolies by states. Now, whether they were based on the trans-oceanic, the trans-Saharan, or even the internal domestic transport, these slave trading mechanisms delivered persons into slavery. But who participated in the slave trade? Well, educational and scientific institutions, religious institutions engaged in slave trading. Although in our imaginations, we envision ships departing from the European cities of Liverpool or Bordeaux or Nantes or from Lisbon that sail to the Gold Coast of Africa, West Africa first, and then take off for Bahia, Brazil, or Haiti, or Barbados in order to deliver their captures. We should also envision that the slave trade was land-based. It was concluded by very ordinary commercial contracts, sales, or an auction blocks, Sometimes slaves were redeemed for debts that were owned, that's slave trading, where they were used in barter or exchange or held as collateral on loans that were defaulted. We should understand that that is just as much slave trading as these ships that cross the ocean. But even less recognized was the common practice of the trade in slaves among family members by inheritance, by gifts, by bequeaths upon death, the slave trade often occurred in the form of a donation of a gift. Specialized niches of the slave trade existed. And some of these special niches focused on the sexualized nature of human goods. Because human goods could also be future breeders, they could be eunuchs, they could be concubines. So certain slave trade rates, routes really included more males than females or more children than adults or at times more females than males. It depended on what would be the gendered nature of the slavery into which they would be reduced. The gendered separations of slaves notably manifested in certain peculiar means. 
both in the West African trade and the East African trade. For example, under Islamic law, Muslim men could marry no more than four wives at a time. There was no limit, however, on how many concubines they could have. So thus wealthy and often elite men bought the most attractive female slaves as concubines. And it was a very common form of slavery called harem slavery. I'm not speaking of the legitimate wives. I'm speaking of a sector of the slave trade, of the East African slave trade that was developed in order to nourish the Ottoman Empire's need for concubines. Ethiopian and European girls and young women from the Caucasus were enslaved in these harems as concubines. On the Swahili coast between the 16th and the 19th century, the Katwa, a small Somali ethnic group, specialized in slave trading females, such as the non-Muslim Omaru of the Southern Ethiopia into the Ottoman Empire. But this haram slavery also compromised, comprised the enslavement of boys and men as eunuchs. Eunuchs were really a very lucrative part of the trade, even though they were quite a hidden part of the trade in some areas. The trade in eunuchs was concentrated in the Nile Basin of Western Sudan. What is a eunuch? Well, youthful males became eunuchs by castration or by what was called gelding. Let's not be judgmental. Castration was widespread throughout Europe during that time period, and the Catholic Church was not against it. We had the castrati opera singers, remember? But castration entailed the removal of testicles, penises, or both reproductive organs. This gelding occurred during the trade, not when the eunuch arrived at the enslavement place. It occurred during the trade because generally Islamic law forbids Muslims to conduct castrations. So therefore, Western Sudanese slave traders use reputed surgeons from the Malsi region of what is now the current Nigeria or Northeast Nigeria to geld these male slaves, while Ethiopian traders employed Coptic monks to perform the castrations. Eunuchs were very valuable as slaves precisely due to their neutered sexual state, which made them incapable of having sexual intercourse, in particularly with the concubines. So consequently, slave masters authorized eunuchs to guard the harem. Once enslaved, eunuchs were often traded or given away as gifts. So they were slave traded many times into slavery and during slavery. At the turn of the 19th century, looking now toward the West African trade. Influenced by Haiti's twofold emancipation, Haiti liberated itself both from French colonialism and from slavery, the only country so to do so. At that point, the United States and the United Kingdom hastened to halt the importation of African slaves. The effect of the Haitian Revolution was direct upon lowering and stopping the importation of African slaves by other slave-owning nations. So therefore, the United Kingdom banned their own slave trade in 1807. And by 1810, Britain began to enter into bilateral accords with Portugal, with France, with Spain, with Brazil, and other states to outlaw the transatlantic slave trade. Remember that these accords to outlaw the transatlantic slave trade did not intend to abolish domestic slavery, nor did it abolish the internal or the domestic slave trade. The import ban, as a matter of fact, in the United States had a vicious result. It increased the internal slave market and it intensified the procreation of slaves. It prompted a sector of the slave trade within the United States that concentrated on trading female slaves known as wenches, male slaves known as breeders. They were touted to be fertile and fecund. Sociologist Ram Rami Berry assures us that the breeding of slaves was akin to animal husbandry. It was a sexual economy that heightened with the internal slave trade in the United States. And this slave trade, as you can imagine, was gendered. There were certain types of slaves. One was a slave type called fancy girls, 
who were fancy girls? Well, they were female slaves of mixed race with European facial features. They were often kept in brothels or individual homes for the sexual pleasures of white males. Slave traders sold them at a higher price at the slave market. You know, lesser acknowledged, but very common sexualized gendered slave trading practices included the trading of females who were wanted for their breast milk. It was called wet nursing. The commodification of a slave's breast milk created another way that she could be valued. In Brazil, this wet nursing is called mercenary nursing. And it was also very commonplace in South America. So at slave markets, certain future slave owners would buy wet nurses and they would prefer that these wet nurses were unencumbered. And unencumbrance is a codified way of saying, do not buy the slave with her children. We would prefer if her children were not bought, there she, therefore she would have more breast milk for other slave children and for the children of the slave masters. The abolition of slavery finally comes in North and South America during the 19th and 20th centuries. It dismantles all of these institutions and these niches of the slave trade that I have been telling you about. Eventually, because global economics change and political uh, organization changes, and because of advocacy of human rights, um, what was the future or the pre-human rights movement, the abolitionist movement, and also because of the colonization of Africa and India, slavery in the new world died out, was actually transformed into other parts, other forms of labor. So now that I have imparted just a sliver of what the slave trade was and what some of its functions performed, I'd like to turn our attention to its outlawing. Actually, it was outlawed in the 1926 Slavery Convention. It's a slavery convention to suppress slavery and the slave trade. Outlawing both at the same time made common sense because without the slave trade, there is no slavery. So the 1926 prescribes slavery in the slave trade and defines the slave trade in the following way. The slave, slave trade is all acts involved in the capture the acquisition or the disposal of a person with intent to reduce him, and I'm going to add him or her, into slavery. The slave trade also involves all acts in the acquisition of a slave with a view to selling or exchanging him or her, or all acts of disposal by sale, exchange of a slave, acquiring a slave, or the view of selling a slave in the future, and in general, every act of trade or transport. So it's important to understand that the slave trade really prohibits perpetrators who possess the intention to reduce a person, male or female, into a condition of slavery, slavery that's de jure or de facto. It's just as important to really understand that the further exchange or transport of someone who is already enslaved constitutes slave trading. Even though a slave trader must intend to reduce a person to slavery, if that slavery doesn't occur, the crime of the slave trade or slave trading still has occurred. So to comprehend the slave trade definition, let's look briefly at the definition of well, what is slavery? What are you reducing the person into? And the same convention, the 1926 convention, defines slavery as the status or condition of a person over whom any or all the powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. Now, any or all of the powers, remember, that does not mean chattel slavery, a legal title. It can also mean de facto slavery. So the 1926 convention recognizes that these two crimes, slavery and the slave trade, really occur in tandem. Their institutions are interlinked, even though they are distinct crimes. Let's try and understand what is the link and what is the distinction. 
Okay, the crime of slavery criminalizes the status or condition of slavery, a slave. The offense of slave trading criminalizes the reduction of a person into slavery or the transportation of slaves to another situation of enslavement. Slave trading therefore precedes slavery and can occur during slavery. Let me underline that slave trading is not a lesser included offense of slavery. It is a separate distinct international crime. The slave trader is not a mere accessory to slavery, it is not just an aider or a better. The slave trade and the slave trader intend and therefore act to reduce someone, male or female, adult or child, into slavery. But they don't use to exercise powers of ownership over this person. They're not a slave holder. Still, the act of slave trading is committed whenever the slave is moved or the person is moved into slavery. Again, slavery usually precedes, slave trading, I'm sorry, precedes slavery. But also think about it this way, that there can be a chain of slave traders that keep trading a person and maybe only after the fourth slave trader is the person actually reduced to slavery. But each of the four slave trading situations are criminal because their intent is even if they give it to another slave trader is to eventually have the person reduced into slavery. And again, I'll say that a slave trader need not be a slave owner. However, a slave owner might be a slave trader. Slave trading doesn't require the exercise of any or all the powers of ownership. Okay, that's our mini course on the 1926 Slavery Convention and actually the 1956 Slavery Convention basically reiterates the same thing, but also emphasizes how persons can be placed through multiple situations of slave trading. So what other laws do we have about slave trading? Well, the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals, they rendered convictions for deportation to slave labor as a crime against humanity and as slavery as a war crime. The Nuremberg Tribunal, for example, found one of the defendants, Vorman, guilty for his participation in the wartime slave labor program. One of the facts they brought out was that he transferred over 500,000 female domestic workers from the East, meaning Poland and Eastern Europe into Germany. It's the transfer that was the slave trading part. The Tokyo Tribunal convicted General Hata, Commander Kamura, uh, War Minister Tojo of the crime of slave labor. And how were people reduced into slavery? By conscription, by acquisition, by false promises. This was the evidence of the deportation to slave labor or what we would call slave trading. So these distinct facts of transfer and conscription should be understood to be a means of seeing how the international military tribunals for the Far East and for Nuremberg included notions and concepts of slave trading within their jurisprudence. But let's turn to the Yugoslav and the Rwanda tribunal because they're the most recent apparitions. And I think it's important that we understand to what extent did they criminalize the slave trade. The International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and for Rwanda enumerate enslavement as a crime against humanity, but the statutes do not explicitly enumerate the prohibition of the slave trade under crimes against humanity. The Yugoslav Tribunal's provision for war crimes, Article 3, did have jurisdiction over serious violations of humanitarian law. And even if these provisions, prohibitions, were not explicitly enumerated in Article 3, the court, via the famous Tadic test, could have jurisdiction. And they could have jurisdiction over serious violations that were based in customary law or treaty law. And so arguably, the slave trade could have been tried under Article 3 of the Yugoslav statute. The Rwanda statute, and in particular, their provision for war crimes, Article 4, stated that Article 4 shall not be limited to the express provisions listed. It therefore acknowledged that other prohibitions, such as slave trading, if it were customary based in law, could be justiciable. On the other hand, the Special Court for Sierra Leone 
and the Extraordinary Criminal Chambers of Cambodia had war crimes provisions that were exclusive. They disallowed the pursuit of any war crimes that were not explicitly listed. The special court for Sierra Leone, as a matter of fact, summarized which war crimes it would find under its jurisdiction, while the extraordinary criminal chambers for Cambodia said that they were based upon the grave breaches of 1948 in terms of the war crimes that they would go after. And the slave trade is not contained in the grave breaches. Okay, so the Yugoslav and the Rwanda tribunals offered a legal basis, an implicit legal basis, in which slave trading could be pursued. However, there is no jurisprudence of the Yugoslav tribunal regarding slave trading. The Yugoslav case of Kunarats, which everyone readily agrees, was a great case to look at enslavement, and in particularly sexualized enslavement, was a case that centered on Bosnian Serbs who enslaved Bosnian Muslim women in the town of Focha. But the Kunarats trial chamber offers no definitive pronouncement about the crime of slave trade. Nevertheless, it found compelling the manner in which the Bosnian females were reduced into the sexualized enslavement. It was done by sale, by transfer, by handing over the females, by transport among perpetrators. The tribunal said that acquisition or disposal of someone for monetary or other compensation is not a requirement of enslavement. But it did not pronounce on whether that was a slave trade. That is an unfortunate absence. But one has to say that the chambers cannot pronounce upon what has not been alleged, what has not been put before them, and what has not been directed and legally characterized. But still, there is a legal lacuna that we can sense. Let's move over to the Rome Statute. Now, the Rome Statute, as a matter of fact, erases the slave trade. And it's a bit bewildering, even if it was well-intentioned. Uh, I believe it was an omission. First, neither the slave trade nor slavery are enumerated under Article 8, which is the exclusive war crimes provision of the Rome Statute. The slave trade's prohibition should definitely be a war crime. It's uncontroversial that it exists under humanitarian law. Why? Because wars historically provided captives to trade as slaves. The renowned Libra Code of 1863, which governed the Union troops, basically all the American troops, but specifically the Union troops of the United States during the, guerre, uh, during the Civil War, Guerre Succession, declares in Article 58 that if an enemy of the United States should enslave and sell any captured person of their army, that they should be met with the harshest retribution. And it's notable that this humanitarian law prescription of slave trading and slavery within the US Army predates the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which outlaws or banned slavery. So the omission of slavery in the slave trade as war crimes in the Rome Statute was probably non-deliberate, non-logical even. It seems to have been a moment of, I would say, graciously, legal distraction rather than legal intention. So similar to the recent amendment in the Rome Statute to include the war crime of starvation, I would urge the inclusion of a provision on slavery and the slave trade under the war crimes provision of Article 8. This should be undertaken. Let's move to Article 7 of the Rome Statute, the Crimes Against Humanity provision. It defines enslavement. I would ask for your patience because even I remain confused until this day of this definition concerning enslavement. The Rome Statute says that enslavement means the exercise of any or all the powers attaching to the right of ownership over a person. I'm fine until there. And it includes the exercise of such power in the course of trafficking in persons and in particular, women and children. I think I can understand the intent. I just can't understand the legal dissection. 
because this description in some ways is very similar to the 1926 slavery convention, but it confusingly inserts this phrase trafficking, particularly in women and children. I say that's confusing because trafficking in persons is a transnational crime that descends from several treaties concerning white slavery. These prohibitions were grounded in prohibitions against enforced prostitution. They are not related to the West African slave trade or the East African slave trade. However, has a Rome statute now created a crime trafficking within another crime, enslavement? Well, the International Criminal Courts document elements of crimes do not cite to any elements of trafficking when they refer to the crime or when they define enslavement. Obstensively, trafficking is neither a separate crime nor an element of enslavement under the Rome Statute. Rather, it describes conduct. The Office of the Prosecutor also affirms this conclusion in the policy paper on sexual and gender-based crimes and in the strategic plan of 2016 to 2018, it notes that the court does not have jurisdiction over trafficking offenses. However, this confusion kind of remains uh, in most people's mind because there's a confusion between the slave trade and trafficking. Indeed, trafficking can be said to legally resemble the slave trade a bit because neither trafficking nor the slave trade require the exercise of powers of ownership. But whenever traffickers exercise powers of ownership over a person, they're essentially perpetuating slavery. The trafficker may raise also a defense in saying that the trafficked person consented to be trafficked and therefore that the trafficker should not be held or should not be convicted. Adult victims of trafficking can say that they agree to the trafficking. What would have to be proven is that there were no coercive circumstances, no abuse of power. But by contrast, the slave trade does not rely on issues of consent or require coercive circumstances. As a matter of fact, consent and coercive circumstances have no legal effect. Like slavery, the slave trade focuses in on the intent of the perpetrator. Consent is neither an element nor defense to the slave trade. So consistent with the language in the 1926 Slavery Convention and the 1956 Convention, the slave trader's intent to reduce someone into a state or condition of slavery and their acts to do it suffice for the crime. The victim's state of mind might be interesting. It is not legally relevant. Even if the victim says, I want to be slave traded, the crime of slave trading can still occur. So the Rome Statutes, Article 7, uh, 2E, which describes this form of slavery and then inserts trafficking when powers of exercise are owned, is really talking about enslavement and not about trafficking. So therefore, in sum, when we look at the Rome Statute, it doesn't enumerate slavery or the slave trade as a war crime. It doesn't clearly incorporate the slave trade as a crime against humanity. And it seems to muddle the definitions of trafficking to make one think almost of the slave trade. But the consequence is that the slave trader's conduct is not implicated explicitly under the ICC jurisdiction. The failure to enumerate a provision for the slave trade as a crime against humanity has detrimental consequences it leaves an almost inconceivable impunity gap and therefore allows perpetrators who conduct slave trading to have to be legally characterized under what I would say would be a de minimis provision such as cruel treatment or other inhumane acts. Putting the name on the crime is part of the power of the crime. So what importance does having, does what importance is there in reviving this crime today of the slave trade? Well, I think today the slave trade is a legal tool that we need because the international community bears witness 
right now to persistent acts of slave trading. Let me talk about two, the Yazidi community. It's undisputed that ISIS fighters enslave Yazidi women, girls, and boys. And due to their adherence to a political ideology of gender inequality and religious superiority, ISIS arranged for its male fighters to buy, sell, give as gifts, female captives. These female captives and the boy children were the spoils of war. They publicly set up an organization within the caliphate that institutionalized what I call precursory conduct to slavery, meaning the conduct that comes before slavery. That conduct is slave trading. If we remember how the 1926 convention shows that slave trading usually precedes slavery. So ISIS set up the committee for the buying and selling of slaves. The name could not be clearer. The name could not be more purposeful. What it intended to do was to distribute the Yazidi females at organized slave markets. So ISIS required fighters to pre-register for their slave purchases of females, and they priced and sold the females often according to age. The Yazidis reported that prior to their enslavement, they too were registered by officials at holding centers in Syria, loaded onto trucks, moved into holding sites in Iraq, and then ISIS fighters documented the names, ages, and marital status of the females. They then photographed them at holding sites. At times, ISIS auditioned, auctioned, I'm sorry, Yazidi women and children online, replete with their registration information, their photos, and the minimum purchase price. All of those acts apply to the definition of conduct that was outlawed under the slave trade in the 1926 Slavery Convention and the 1956 Convention. Is there another example that we can bear witness to? Yes, and that is in Libya. Their border officials have held male and female migrants in detention blocks, and they engage in the slave trade. In between trading these migrants, the migrants are subjected to ruthless male-on-male -male sexual violence, male-on-female sexual violence, genital mutilation, forced nudity, and other gendered and sexualized violence. They're often held ransom until their families pay the traders to release them. An open slave market also exists where the migrants are bought for a few hundred US dollars. And the videos that have been exposing these slave markets show us that big boys, strong men, are sold to the highest buyers to perform farm labor, and that females are also bought and kept for sexual purposes. In conclusion, I would like to say that yes, we certainly still need in our legal quiver the crime of the slave trade, because the slave trade continues and its prohibition is at the core of the international crime of the slave trade that has use cohesion status and ergo omnis obligations. The slave trade's implicit and explicit omission from international judicial instruments as a war crime or as a crime against humanity or as a distinct international crime based upon customary law it is frankly baffling today, given the prevalence of slave trading. Several factors may have contributed to it. First, the international case law has been more focused on looking at slavery and looking at sexual slavery and not understanding the precursory or the conduct that precedes slavery, which is a slave trade. Second, there's a miscomprehension of how the slave trade and slavery have a type of joint legal framework. Slavery right now is obscuring the slave trade's judicial utility. And third, the statutes of the ad hoc tribunals and of the ICC tend to shrink from obligations of having brought forward evidence that could be legally characterized as the slave trade. 
Article eight of the Rome Statute omits slavery. Article seven does not incorporate slavery into its crimes against humanity. I believe this is shameful. If it was intentional, our intent must change. And lastly, the description or the descriptor of trafficking in persons muddles the distinction between the slave trade and between slavery, and it hampers their interlinked functionality. I would close by saying that indeed, we need to return to the international crime of the slave trade to grasp that conduct. The Rome Statute, and I think even the proposed Crimes Against Humanity Treaty should include provisions that prescribe the slave trade. The legal neglect of the slave trade that was exacted upon the comfort, of women, comfort women and the potential of denial of redress for enslaved Yazidis and for migrants transiting through Libya are compounded by our failure not to refurbish the slave trade. The slave trade appears to be missing in action. Please send out a search party. Please rescue, recover, resuscitate, and then deploy the slave trade as an international crime that can serve the international community. Thank you very much. Okay, I think people are clapping across the clapping across the across the globe there. Patty, thank, thank you. Guys. Sorry, it got darker in Brussels during that talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, maybe, maybe uh, appropriately. Yeah, right. uh, you gave you left us with a little bit of light at the end. But um, thank you for that incredibly rich uh, and and you know broad and deep examination of the neglected topic of the slave trade, and and I think putting it in that wide historical context and making it so relevant, not just to the situations that you've described in terms of the Yazidi uh, enslavement and the Libyan um, slave markets, but also of course to the reckoning with the after effects, persistent after effects of the slave trade here in the United States today. So, I mean, thank you so much. We have questions already in the chat. And um, I'd like to open by just asking you to uh, pull apart a little bit more something which you, you, which was threaded through your speech. And that's really like what um, the significance of, you know, using those prohibition on the slave trade. I mean, you indicated a couple of reasons of why it's so important. Um, one of them would be the classic impunity gap that perpetrators themselves might escape any kind of accountability. Another one might be that certain acts, even if a perpetrator is prosecuted for other acts, for example, slavery itself or enslavement, uh, the acts themselves won't be captured in the prohibition. And I'd love to hear a little bit. You said briefly, I think that, you know, putting the naming, putting the name on the crime is part of the power of the crime. And I know that that's something that you um, have managed to achieve in the area of sexual violence, prosecution of such sexual violence, which was not happening, uh, even though perpetrators might have been held responsible for something else. And how important is it that all of the criminal behavior is encaptured, you know? And then lastly, moving on from that, um, what does that, what is the risk to the norm itself of the failure to uh, fully prosecute that crime despite the actual practical um, impunity gap? Uh, so I would love you to speak a little more about those implications of the lacuna you've identified. Yes, thank you very much, Kate. Um, I would uh, like to start out by, by saying that it is the moment of the reckoning and I think it's a moment of international criminal reckoning. And why does international criminal law, as it has been forthcoming now in understanding uh, genocide, the sexualized nature of genocide, even um, some of the um, other crimes, deportation, the uh, war crimes and crimes against children, why have we always seemed to have overlooked slave trading and readily run to trafficking? I ask myself, what happened there? These, these are crimes that, as I try to emphasize today, descend from very poignant factual historical basis and crimes that were committed in large swaths, not only against Africa, I haven't been able to talk about Africa and Africa descendants, I haven't been able to really expand upon uh, the enslavement of indigenous peoples in North and South America. America, as you noted, the land on which uh, you stand today, uh, the enslavement of the Bacha boys in Afghanistan today, 
So it is very important from my point of view is that we understand that these historical incidents of slave trading continue today. They might have a slightly different manifestation, but when the 1926 and 1956 uh, conventions outlawed slavery and the slave trade in all their forms, I mean, why add that phrase, all their forms? It's because they're very myriad forms of slave trading. And so today what we're often seeing is slave trading and it's important to name it. When the ICRC has their customary law, uh, rule 94, which is the war crimes uh, prohibition against slavery and the slave trade, they add all its forms. And so I think that as international criminal lawyers that we're doing less than our due diligence not to use an appropriate uh, treaty-based, customary law-based uh, crime that describes criminal conduct that's occurring today. The risk to the norm is that by not using it, it will lose its customary law basis. We might have opinio jurors, we don't seem to have the practice. And certainly that's, that's quite astounding that we don't have the practice. And developing practice of trafficking should not be confused with the practice of slave trade as a prohibition, as a use caution prohibition. The other thing um, I would say is that naming, naming the crime specifically really, I think, assists the investigator, the prosecutor, victim's counsel. I think it assists the defendant to know really what their, their acts are legally categorized as. And it also allows the submissions to the judges to be clarified. Up until now, we have a lot of um, jurisprudence that refers to kidnapped, ad abducted, conscripted, but when you look at it closely, it could be charged in two manners. Yes, the conscription could be the conscription of child soldiers, but that might be also coincide with the acts to reduce those children, male and female, into slavery. And I, I think we're at a mature part in international criminal law that we should go forward with that basis. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to... Um... I'd like to continue our talk until quarter past 10, if everyone's available, because we had some problems at the beginning starting, and I have a lot of questions in the chat and I'd love to have the opportunity to put some of them to you. So, um, uh, <clears throat> seeing if I can group these. Um, well, there's one straightforward question about, uh, this is from Joe Cabrin, about whether there is any jurisprudence on the slave, slave trade, any useful recent jurisprudence, either from domestic jurisdictions or at the international level. Um, and perhaps I could uh, couple that with the question from um, Rizwan al-Islam, who asks whether in some extreme cases, severely degrading treatment of migrant workers could amount to slavery. Well, there is not enough jurisprudence on specifically the slave trade. That's the point of me trying to send out the search party, right? Let's go find it. Uh, but very interesting, uh, this week, um, uh, Legal Action Worldwide Law uh, submitted a case before the Lebanon uh, First Instance Criminal Court about slave trading and slavery that deals with a domestic worker, an Ethiopian domestic worker. So we're looking forward to seeing what will happen there. And I think that there might be possibilities when we look at our IIIM mechanisms of how they'll characterize evidence that could eventually become part of the jurisprudence. And um, possibly in some of the national universal jurisdiction cases that would be bought on behalf of Yazidis in Germany, we might have jurisprudence on the slave trade that's more explicit. Thank you. Then there's a question which I think will go to some of the um, well, the, the question is, perpetrate from Laura Perez, perpetrators of child recruitment have been held criminally responsible for the crime of underage conscription. Could the crime of slavery be used to try perpetrators of child conscription by arguing that underage recruiters exercise powers of ownership? In these cases, the intent of the perpetrator is clear. Well, let me, let me circle back to the one question and pick up. I think the situation of the migrant workers in Libya, if we look at it closely factually, there might be situations where powers of ownership are being exercised over them and that could be slavery. But what the evidence seems to show right now is that the smugglers slash slave traders do not want to exercise powers of ownership over them. They want to move them through different situations and receive money as ransom or slave trading them 
through certain series until they take boats to wherever they wanna go in terms of refugee status. So the facts might show us slavery, but I think the facts might show us that some of the smugglers are slave traders. In terms of the child's uh, conscription, yes, I think it, it's very interesting because the special court for Sierra Leone recognizes that some of the child soldiers were enslaved. Uh, the boy soldiers and the girl soldiers are saying they were sexually enslaved. Well, when one looks at sexualized enslavement, let's say all of those child soldiers were enslaved, well, the recruiters, those who placed them in that situation of being child soldiers, they might not have been exercising powers of ownership over them, but they certainly were reducing them into situations of slavery. And one could look at them possibly as slave traders you might see the members of the militia group to which the child soldiers adhere to. They might be the ones who are exercising the powers of ownership over these children. And there's no reason that, you know, we certainly know in the international criminal law world that you can have cumulative charging. Uh, you can charge uh, conscription, uh, recruitment, conscri conscription of child soldiers and charge enslavement or slave trading um, based upon the same facts, as long as you can establish the mens rea and the actus reas of each separate crime. Thank you. And I have a question from Judge Nyla Ayubi about um, modern slavery that's happening now in the US uh, and what your opinion is um, about that. Well, <clears throat> I, I have to confess, I am not a fan of the term modern slavery. I think slavery is as ancient and is continuing. I think sometime when we conflate slave trading and slavery with trafficking, we seem to put this moniker on it that it's modern. And that was among the reasons that I wanted to show, well, what actually was the nature of slave trading before? And to emphasize that we're just seeing a different type of manifestation of it. Is it contemporary? Maybe so. Am I making a lot over a word? Yes. I think the fact that slave trading and slavery is still going on in the United States or any of the Americas or any nation after having had a history of not only slave trading, internal domestic slave trading, fighting a war for slavery, understanding the effects of what happens when you enslave populations, I think is just absolutely legally, morally, politically, economically untenable, immoral, we not only know better, we should be acting to, to abolish, to abolish the slavery systems, but also the slave trading systems to, that the slave traders are profiting off of the inaction, our inaction. Thank you. That leads to a question from Alexandra Lily Kather, which I have, who asks what we can do to support the slave trade becoming a crime under the Rome Statute. And maybe I would broaden that out a little and ask you, you know, how you see, how you envisage us responding to your call to action. I mean, you obviously are doing the research and putting out, you know, a very coherently um, argued um, legal strategy or legal argument around this. What would you, how would you see we should respond to that call to action? What can we do to advance that call? Well, uh, thanks, Kate. There, I think there's several things you can do. First of all is to, you know, uh, first educate yourself so that you understand you're talking to. I think that there can be civil society uh, absolutely informing itself and advocating um, for an amendment to the Rome Statute. I believe that the upcoming Crimes Against Humanity Treaty that's been proposed, it's been proposed uh, without a provision for the slave trade uh, in it. And I think that that's certainly uh, a point of advocacy and information sharing with um, General Assembly members. I believe it's still in the Sixth Committee. I think that we can call out and denounce uh, ignoring slave trading as being almost a way of ignoring the harms that historically happened to Africa and happened to people of African descent in the Americas and in um, Asia who were enslaved. Uh, I think that there is a part of the reckoning that we're in the midst of, and part of that reckoning has to do with how we interpret international criminal law. And I would also like to say that um, from one of our co-sponsors, American Society of International Law and the Black American Society of International Law, we are going to be looking at issues of reparations uh, for slavery and also reparations one has to think of for the slave trade because there were two crimes in tandem that occurred together relentlessly until uh, the slave trade was abolished, slavery could not have been abolished. 
So I think that there are going to be many rallying points and hopefully during the next 15 to uh, 18 months. It's a very important and timely issue. Thank you. Um, I have a question about <clears throat> the UN Special Rapporteurs and the relationship between the Rapporteurs on slavery and on human trafficking and whether you have a concern about the overlapping mandate of those two Rapporteurs. I guess that goes back to your um, concern about certain elements being lost in the way crimes are framed in the Rome Statute and so on. Well, yes, I do. I think my co-author, uh, Professor Jocelyn uh, Gitkin Kestenbaum is looking into this issue much more closely. She'll be producing an article because even under um, the international human rights law instruments, uh, you have slavery in the slave trade. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about slavery in the slave trade in all its forms, as does the International um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But we come to CEDAW and we have no prohibition of the slave trade. We have a prohibition of trafficking. Once again, we're going back to looking at what could be slave trading as trafficking. M my position is that trafficking is a wonderful transnational crime. I think that um, as females, we should be able to be protected from trafficking and from the slave trade. One doesn't obviate the other, but we have to make sure that they're distinctly understood so that distinct uh, governance and protection can be offered. But it's very interesting that with the special rapporteurs, they too, in my opinion, seem to be conflating, as are the treaty bodies when they look into their jurisprudence, of they're conflating trafficking with slave trading. Someone might have been um, discussing what is slave trading and use them sometimes as interchangeable terms. And in that sense, it weakens um, as you suggested, the customary law basis, opinion jurors, the practice, and therefore I think it eventually weakens the protection afforded for persons who are caught within a slave trading or trafficking system. Thank you, and I'm interested to say that that was a question from Alison Donders, uh, Renton. Um, okay, I have somebody who wants to dive into the Rome Statute issue. <clears throat> Um, Matthew Wetherill asks whether the definition of enslavement included in the Rome Statute seems to show that the drafters were thinking of the slave trade to an extent, but do you think they may have been too preoccupied with differentiating between the different forms of enslavement included within the statute, e.g. slavery, sexual slavery and enforced prostitution? Do you think that there uh, are any... Tell them, don't get me started on my next lecture, okay? Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I read over, I read over all of the... Um, um, what do you call it, uh, preparatory works, the uh, draft comments for the Rome Statute, and particularly as it looks at slave trading and uh, uh, enslavement. And what happened under the war crimes provision is it was, it was drafted in, um, at, in one instance, and then the group never got around to discussing it, and it falls out. I really think that there was some lack of serious follow through. And I think what happens under crimes against humanity, uh, we get this big broad definition of enslavement that in some ways uh, parallels the 1926 convention. And I think with a lot of good intentions, someone said, well, isn't this like trafficking? Let's make sure we put trafficking in. It says, well, to make sure we don't forget women and children. Yes, trafficking women and children, puppies and dogs and roses. Let's make sure we get it all stuck in there, okay? Uh, as opposed to maybe having a very good legal advisor saying, well, you know, trafficking is not enslavement. So it looks as if the court itself has had to resolve that issue by clearly saying that you see it's not in the elements of the offenses. Um, it's not under our jurisdiction. In terms of sexual slavery, I think there was a, a, a big push. And, you know, I have to say maybe Kunarod's helped that push to bring in sexual slavery. I think in hindsight, uh, the push for sexual slavery was very good, very positive, but I would prefer that if enslavement was understood to encompass the sexualized forms of enslavement, because I feel that sexual slavery, as we understand it now and how the jurisprudence comes out, tends to be fairly uh, heteronormative, tends to be fairly uh, sexual violence that relates to rape. It doesn't get into um, uh, holding a, a young girl as a fancy girl and waiting until she menstruates. It doesn't really get into the nature probably of some of the um, uh, sexual violence that is perpetrated against males where you don't have to be held out. You've already been maybe uh, castrated. So I would prefer in hindsight, uh, and this sounds her heretical, not to have sexual slavery, but to have an understanding that enslavement encompasses any and all 
of the powers of ownership over your sexual autonomy, your sexual integrity, psychologically or physically. And I think if that had been, if we'd been in a different, more mature point of discussing that when the Rome Statute was drafted, that that would be clearer today. We would understand what comes under enslavement, be much broader. We wouldn't be bifurcating and feminizing sexual slavery and masculizing enslavement. And maybe we would have a specific provision for slave trading right under enslavement in the Rome Statute for Crimes Against Humanity. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck by the, I mean, listening to your, uh, you know, broad overview of slave trading uh, that you introduced us to in your lecture, I'm struck by the absence of that conversation and debate around uh, the formation of these international criminal law norms. And of course, yeah, as you've alluded to, we, you know, we have to think about why that is, right? And it may be, as you said, that now is a moment when, uh, um, when the world is going to be more receptive to taking a deeper look at uh, the history of slavery and, and what that says about how we can continue to eradicate both slavery and the and the legacies of slavery today. Um, I have a couple of questions <clears throat> left. Um, I mean, I have one question which perhaps you could address briefly, which is um, asking you to elaborate about slavery in Afghanistan, which you mentioned uh, briefly in passing. Are they referring to the Bacha boys that I, I mentioned? Think, yes. Right, I, I think it's um, a, a very a very singular form of slave trading and enslavement when we have these young boys who are basically um, either slightly under or just about coming into puberty, and then they're asked to basically dress as women, dance as, fe not women, females, dance as females, and often be subjected to uh, sexual, sexual violence, particularly if we look at the under 18 year old child cannot give genuine consent. But they're very reminiscent that there were other forms of slave uh, trading and, and slavery that entailed young boys. I mean, it goes back to Greece. There, there were instances in the United States, a slight underground market of uh, young boys who were kept in brothels. So once we understand how slave trading and slavery uh, affect children in particular, and how it affects in terms of gender and sex, um, I think that we would be much more readily accepted to move out of this type of excuse of, oh, well, that's a cultural tradition. Oh, you can't do that because it's, um, you know, that this has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I, I think that that's a situation of um, slave trading, particularly when the men gift the boys around at times. And unfortunately, we're in economic situations where parents give their children, i.e. slave trade their children uh, for debts. As I said, one of the reasons for slave trading is monetary. Thank you. I think we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I, there's, I mean, it's such a rich presentation. I think there's a, a lot of different questions people would like to, you to expand on, but I would maybe mention that you have published a couple of articles in this area, um, which uh, the participants can find. What would be the best way for them to well, find Well, look, them? there's um, the one in the International Just, the Justice of International Criminal Justice is really the same um, title of this lecture, you know, Missing in Action, the Slave Trade. There's going to be another article coming out with um, a Professor uh, Kirsten Baum that we were writing that really looks more at the sexualized nature of the slave trade and slavery. And this has been the basis of some of the lecture today. And there's a previous lecture uh, that was based upon the um, case against the Chadian dictator Habre that looked into customary law's basis of sexualized slavery. And it's a way of understanding how sexual slavery now that we keep enumerating is, is really part of customary law's sexualized notions of enslavement. So you can find these on SSRN or look, look up my name or email me and I'll send you an embargoed copy. No, I won't, I won't. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, with that, it just remains uh, for me to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and thank you so much, Pali, for sharing this uh, absolutely fascinating and, uh, you know, deeply important and increasingly urgent issue with us today. Thank you so much.